On this episode of Skeptico, Alex talks with Dr. Rupert Sheldrick about being censored by the TED conference. The irony of this is, if not hilarious, it's certainly inescapable. I mean, a reputable scientist publishes a book claiming that science is dogmatic and then is censored by an anonymous scientific board. What does this say how science can be dogmatic without even realizing it's dogmatic? Well, I think in a way, this this whole controversy and the people who weighed in in favor of the TED actions do indeed confirm what I'm saying, that these dogmas are ones that most people within science don't actually realize are dogmas. They just think they're the truth. And the point about really dogmatic people is that they don't know they have dogmas. Dogmas are beliefs. And people who have really strong beliefs think of their beliefs as the truth. They don't actually see them as beliefs. So I think this whole controversy has actually highlighted exactly that. The other thing it's highlighted is that there are a lot of people, far more than I imagined actually, who are not taken in by these dogmas, who do want to think about them critically. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and on this episode of Skeptico, well, I'm kind of interrupting my usual interview flow that I have going on to kind of do something timely and newsworthy, and that is I've asked Dr. Rupert Sheldrick to come on and briefly talk about this recent controversy that's been stirred up about him being censored by the TED conference. So it's really caused quite a big stir, and a lot of people are talking about it, and I thought it was so relevant to the kind of topics that we have on here that I would interrupt the three or four interviews I have piled up to publish and ask Dr. Sheldrick to come on. So here is my interview with Dr. Rupert Sheldrick regarding being censored by the TED conference. Today we welcome Dr. Rupert Sheldrick back to Skeptico. Many of you know the work of Cambridge biologist Dr. Rupert Sheldrick, including his latest book, Science Set Free. But now you may have heard that this book has seemed to have struck quite a nerve because Dr. Sheldrick has found himself in the middle of a controversy surrounding the censorship of a video lecture that he presented and that was then posted on the very popular TEDx YouTube channel and then removed after, and get this, by an anonymous scientific board that deemed it unscientific. Rupert, welcome back to Skeptico. Thanks for joining us. Tell us what's happened here. Well, you summarized it more or less. I gave a talk at the TEDx um, series of talks in London, in Whitechapel. Uh, The organizers were young women, students at London University, who organized a very lively event. And it was called Challenging Existing Paradigms. So they asked me to talk about challenging existing paradigms, which seemed um, just the right theme for my book, Science Set Free. So I did a TEDx talk for it. It was extremely popular. The event was sold out. There was a lot of lively discussion. It was really fun. It went up on the TEDx website, as these TEDx talks often do. And it all was well until it was denounced by two of America's leading militant skeptics, uh, P.Z. Myers and Jerry Coyne, um, who didn't like it because it upset their rather dogmatic materialist worldview. So they called for it to be turned, uh, taken down, and they said Ted had discredited itself, etc. They put enormous pressure on Ted, and then they got armies of their supporters to um, send emails to Ted and, and put comments on websites. So the Ted people backed down, they removed it. And then having removed it, they had to justify removing it. So they had this report from their so-called scientific board, an anonymous board, um, I don't know if it includes P. and Jerry Myers or uh, people like that. We we don't know who it includes. They wouldn't reveal it. Um, and they took it down. It's not exactly censorship, as they insist on uh, uh, pointing out. They put it with a kind of health warning. Um, <laughs> right. So that it was still there, but uh, it had been put in a kind of naughty corner of the Internet, not on the main TED site. 
Um, that stirred up a very big controversy, and I replied to the accusations of their science board one by one. They were all very easy to refute. Um, but then the thing spiraled out of control, and a huge controversy blew up all over the Internet with lots of people taking it up on Facebook and blogs. Um, and things were going pretty badly for Ted. Um, I then had a call um, about a week ago from Chris Anderson himself, the head of TED. Um, and he was obviously really worried about this and was trying to calm the situation down, which they've now done by putting my talk on a separate um, blog, separate from the other one they took down by Graham Hancock, and um, saying it's open for debate and having people put comments there online, the great majority of which are supporting my talk uh, and not the actions of Ted or the uh, very intemperate and emotional and, I have to say, rather unintelligent remarks of um, Jerry Coyne and uh, P.Z. Myers. Right. So as you mentioned, Chris Anderson is the founder and the head idea spreader, if you will, at TED. And it's nice to know that he's connected with you personally. I would have loved to have had Mr. Anderson on Skeptico or any of his scientific advisors on Skeptico. I think it would have been quite a debate, really not much of one, because as you alluded to, anyone who reads your point-by-point counter to their claims. It's pretty one-sided, and I think most of the commenters on the TED website would agree with that. But what I thought we might do today to give folks a little sense for the spirit of this discussion, and in a broader sense, this controversy that you bring up in your book, Science Set Free, about whether or not science is dogmatic, whether or not science can get itself out of this rut it's in, what I thought we might use as a vehicle for that is for me to kind of play the role of Chris Anderson and use some of the words and ideas that he spread on his blog about this controversy and get a response from you. Does that sound like something we might be able to do? Oh, yes. Okay. So let's start with this one. First off, Dr. Sheldrick, you got to appreciate the position that TED is in. I mean, the TED conference, TEDx, these are important worldwide brands. We're the ideas worth spreading people. And we have to make sure that the ideas on our site are really worth spreading. And to that end, I'm going to have a hard time keeping a straight face on this. I'm going to. Here we go. One of the hardest lines for us to draw is this line between science and pseudoscience. And Ted, let me tell you, we're committed to science, but we think of it as a process, not as a locked-in body of truth. I want you to know that. But some speakers, as you know, will use the language of science to promote views that are incompatible with all reasonable understanding of the world. And giving them a platform is counterproductive. So, Dr. Sheldrick, you have to understand our position here. I mean, we do have to look into these ideas that are presented on our website. Well, I mean, that is, and uh, I do see where Chris Anderson's point of view. And indeed, I had a long conversation with Chris Anderson on the telephone, and we got on perfectly well. I mean, I wasn't particularly angry or with him or anything like that. I mean, it was a reasonable conversation and, you know, they do have a point. There's a lot of rubbish and there has to be some kind of filter. So I, I'm not against the idea of a filter, but what I am against is the idea of apply, applying a filter in a very partial kind of way. There are lots of things up on the TEDx website which are controversial. For example, um, there are a lot of talks by militant atheists um, which uh, a lot of people find controversial. A lot of people disagree with what they say and think they're factually wrong in a variety of ways. Um, but those haven't been flagged up or put in the naughty corner. Um, those have been uh, allowed absolutely free run on the Internet. They're put up on the main website, um, talks by people like Richard Dawkins, for example. Um, uh, and... Uh, the difference here is that my talk was flagged up as being um, pseudo-scientific because 
Jerry Coyne didn't like it. Well, Jerry Coyne is a very bigoted man who writes very loud mouthed things on his website. And I don't take him very seriously. I mean, he's a, a polemicist, a kind of Dawkins type polemicist. So they paid a lot of attention to what Jerry Coyne and PZ, I suppose you say PZ Myers, um, said on their websites. But if there'd been a similar attack by, say, Christian fundamentalists on Dawkins, they would have ignored it. But if it's by scientific fundamentalists, then they pay attention. And what's more, don't just pay attention, but um, get into a, dig themselves into a hole trying to justify this. So I think the problem here is that the um, this uh, an attempt to filter out content was done extremely in an extremely biased way. If every webs if every TED talk which is controversial uh, was flagged up by somebody who didn't like it and put in the naughty corner, all the most interesting talks would be in the naughty corner. Um, the, the only the dullest uh, would be on the main website. And what's more. Ted, in their instructions to the organizers of the TEDx events, um, told them they wanted controversial talks. They said controversy energizes. But when it's in a particular area, one that upsets the dogmatic materialists, then they back down and say that's not the right thing to have. So I, th I think that it's been inconsistent. And they've um, paid far too much attention to these very biased and I think minority uh, and strident voices. Yeah, but see, Dr. Sheldrick, that's not the case because when they went to their scientific board, the majority of them agreed that your and Graham Hancock's videos should be removed from circulation. Didn't they do the right thing? They went to their anonymous scientific board. Well, we don't know who the scientific board are, so we don't know if it's the right thing. Uh, if we look at the TED Board of Advisors, the Brain Trust for TED, so-called on the website, um, the main people in the area of consciousness studies are S Stephen Pinker and Daniel Dennett, um, both of whom are extreme uh, militant atheists and materialists. So um, we just don't know what kind of people are on the scientific board. Um, and so it's hard, to, and we don't know how many they consulted. Is the majority two out of two, or is it sort of twenty out of uh, sort of thirty, or something? We don't know. I imagine it was just one or two phone calls. You have to acknowledge that these folks have to remain anonymous, right? I mean, they're a scientific board; they they have to be anonymous for obvious reasons. Well, I took this up with Chris Anderson. I said, "Well, why don't they come out of the shadows and and?" Um, tell us who they are. It's hard to face anonymous accusers. So he said, well, we can't ask the scientific board to be named or to come out in public, because if they did, they might get attacked. They might even get pilloried. So I said to him, well, don't you think by making these unreasonable attacks on my talk, accusing me of numerous factual errors of pseudoscience, etc., you're pillorying me? Um, and he said, well, that's different. I said, well, why is it different? Um, he said, well, because you gave the talk. Um, I gave the talk at their invitation, after all. I didn't get paid for it. Um, and I fulfilled all the criteria. You know, it was on emerging, you know, uh, contradicting existing paradigms and so forth. Um, anyway, so this, uh, I, I think, is a, a, a very unreasonable uh, objection, and I think that the science board um, should be named. I mean, after all, he said the analogy was with peer review in journals. In peer review in journals, um, the peer reviewers are anonymous, but so are the people whose papers they're reviewing. The authors are removed from the papers that are submitted to peer reviewers. The whole thing is anonymous. And the editor of the journal who makes the decisions is not anonymous. You can look up the editorial board of any scientific journal and their names are given there. So you know who's ultimately responsible. In this case, you don't. So it's very hard to know whether the scientific board even exists um, or how credible they are. And if they're the criterion of scientific credibility, then we do need to know who they are. They might just be flaky coinite. Okay, so... Uh, finally, let me hit you with one more point that the TED people make. You know, TED and TEDx are brands that are trusted in schools and homes. 
you know, they don't want to hear from some parent whose kid went off to South America to drink ayahuasca because Ted said it was okay. I mean, Dr. Sheldrick, think of the children, or for that matter, some kid who winds up going to school thinking that telepathy is real or that consciousness extends beyond the brain. I mean, we don't want that. I mean, there's a limit to how far you can push an idea until it reaches the point where it's no longer worth spreading. Wouldn't you agree? Well, I agree some ideas are not worth spreading. I do agree with that. Um, but exactly how you make the criterion is another question. And the um, the sudden concern for children um, seems to me rather misplaced. There are already quite a few talks about psychedelics on the TED website. And um, the objection, there's no objection to those apparently, only the one by Graham Hancock. So I don't think this is a consistent objection um, about children. The other thing is that Ted recently sent around um, a guideline to TEDx organizers telling them how to tell science from pseudoscience. It's rather an interesting document. And what it says is genuine science, how to tell genuine science. Basically, genuine science is what's being done by quite a lot of people in universities uh, approved and published in the leading peer-reviewed journals. Um, uh, and if you're in doubt, call up a professor at your local university and ask him about it. And if it's pseudoscience or if it's not genuine science, he'll, he'll tell you. Well, that would be a perfect way of eliminating anything to do with parapsychology from the TED Talks. And also, as several people pointed out on their blogs, it would also have eliminated uh, Albert Einstein because only people who are holding uh, academic posts should be considered for the, uh, to be real scientists. Einstein was a clerk in the patents office in Zurich when his great papers on quantum theory and relativity were published in 1905. Um, and uh, uh, Charles Darwin never had an academic post. Darwin would have been classified as pseudoscience straight away uh, on the TED criteria. So I think they've got themselves... In, you know, they're trying, they made a rash decision hurriedly, and they're trying to justify it. Um, and the more they try to justify it, the more difficult their position becomes. And also, you know, if they want to protect children, then um, why not protect them from some of these militant atheists who uh, may have very disturbing effect on the children's thinking? Um, and so I, th I think that the whole attempt is actually one where Ted have done themselves quite a lot of harm by taking an irrational decision and then trying to justify it in a way that is pretty unconvincing. I mean, I, I sympathize with them, and indeed, when I talk to Chris Anderson, I sympathize with them. I mean, I wouldn't like to be an editor um, of you know a, a series like that because there are people who are borderline cases. You know, what do you... Uh, if there are, you do have to draw lines somewhere. I'm not against drawing lines. I think they have to be drawn. Um, so um, I just think they've handled it pretty badly. So let me switch out of the mode of trying to put forth the TED ideas as much as I can glean them from their from their numerous blog posts and website comments. And mm. let me ask you a couple of questions in general about this because – you know, the irony of this is, if not hilarious, it's certainly inescapable. I mean, a reputable scientist like yourself publishes a book claiming that science is dogmatic and then is censored by an anonymous scientific board. I mean, it's like you can't script that any better. What does this say about really the whole topic of your book and about how science can be dogmatic without even realizing it's dogmatic. Well, I think in a way, there's this whole controversy and the people who've weighed in in favor of the TED um, actions uh, do indeed confirm what I'm saying, that there's, these dogmas are ones that most people within science don't actually realize are dogmas. They just think they're the truth. And the point about really dogmatic people is that they don't know they have dogmas. Dogmas are beliefs. And people who have really strong beliefs think of their beliefs as the truth. They don't actually see them as beliefs. So I think this whole controversy has actually highlighted exactly that. 
The other thing is highlighted is that there are a lot of people, far more than I imagined actually, who are not taken in by these dogmas, who do want to think about them critically. And one of the remarkable things about these discussions is lots and lots of people um, are really up for a discussion of these dogmas. They really want it to happen, far more than I'd imagined actually. Um, So I was very impressed by that. And I think this TED debate has actually um, helped show that the paradigm is shifting, that there's no longer a kind of automatic agreement by the great majority of people to dogmatic assertions by materialists. Yeah, it's almost as if this is somewhat of a marker of the kind of events that would happen in the process of changing a paradigm. Yes, I think this is actually, for me, um, an illustration of actually seeing a paradigm shift in action. I think this controversy, it wouldn't have been a controversy after all if a lot of people hadn't thought that Ted had made the wrong decision. Um, There wouldn't have been large amounts, thousands of comments on blogs all over the internet. Uh, That wouldn't have happened uh, if the majority thought Ted had made the right decision and it was more or less a done deal that materialism was the only acceptable form of science. Now, I think the, the fact that so many people feel strongly about it is exactly why there's been a controversy. And um, I do think we're actually seeing a shift. Also, of course, on these various blogs and discussion forums, now and then, uh, one of the standard skeptic voices comes up with all the standard arguments that we've all had hundreds of times before. But now they're being shot down by people, you know, who are saying, okay, where's your evidence? And and uh, calling them on things which normally they'd get away with. That, too, is a change. It's a kind of empowerment of people to challenge this dogmatic uh, materialism. And maybe in a way, you know, Chris Anderson has unwittingly done you a favor and done this cause, if you will, I hate to say it that way, but has has done certainly your book a favor in drawing attention to your ideas. Do you think that might be true? Well, I think it is, actually. I, I mean, I don't think he's done it on purpose. And I don't have any personal grudge against Chris Anderson. He's a, you know, when I talked to him, I found him a perfectly reasonable chap, and I enjoyed our conversation. But Rupert, he does seem incredibly unaware of the situation as it exists. I mean, even when he tries to recover and says, okay, I understand consciousness is controversial, he has such a kindergarten appreciation for the issues that really are at hand and, and the controversy that really lies at the at the core of that issue of are we these biological robots that are purely a product of our brain or not? I mean, yes. there's a guy that's going to, it's going to take him a lot of education to get to where he could have an intelligent discussion about these issues, no? Well, I think, I think he's personally quite interested. He studied philosophy at Oxford and I think he, he told me, and I think it's probably true, that he's always been interested in the nature of consciousness. I think he probably is. I don't think he was making it up. I thought he was sincere. I think he's, he is a bit behind. I mean, he's surrounded himself with the kind of materialist establishment. And if if you look at his board of advisors, many of them are uh, people who do have this very limited mechanistic view of consciousness. So I think he's living in a kind of mainstream world where he only gets to hear a rather limited range of opinions. But I think this controversy has made him aware that there are a lot more voices out there and a lot of people who don't think in that way. I think it's probably a steep learning curve he's on because he obviously was very naive to start with and he's realizing that actually uh, a lot of people think differently. Great. Well, Dr. Sheldrick, we'll keep an eye on this issue and report to people if anything new happens. But other than that, can you tell us briefly what's going on with you and uh, upcoming presentations you might have or anything else that's in the works? Well, I've, I'm, I'm doing um, various presentations in Europe and, um, and in Britain about uh, my book, The Science Delusion, Science Set Free. The details are on my schedule. Um, I'm doing um, a, a program in Dublin, Ireland, on science and spirituality in April. Um, again, that's on my schedule, and that's happening at Christchurch Cathedral. I'm doing it with the Dean of Christchurch, who I haven't met yet, but um, I'm looking forward to that because 
I think that would be a chance for a dialogue uh, in a you know, relatively orthodox spiritual setting um, and to see how uh, these new ideas in science play out in that kind of dialogue. Um, I'm also, in the summer, much further ahead, I'm um, doing a program at Hollyhock in British Columbia in Canada, where in August, um, end of July, beginning of August, um, a remote and beautiful island where I go every summer with my family. And this time, for the first time, I'm doing it with my two sons, Merlin and Cosmo. Um, Cosmo is an anthropologist and a musician, and Merlin is a tropical ecologist. He's doing a PhD uh, on tropical ecology in Panama. Uh, he's a Smithsonian Research Fellow, and um, is um, he's in England now, but he's just about to go back to the jungle. Um, so we're doing one on called Plants, Minds, and Resonances, and they're both musicians. Uh, we have lively discussions at home. And it's the first time we've ever done something together. So um, I know it's going to be fun for us. I hope it'll be fun for others too. Um, so anyone who's interested in going to something where no one knows where it's going to lead, but where it's uh, almost certain to be fun, that would be a good place to go. And then I'm doing uh, a workshop in September with uh, Mark Andrus, who's the Bishop of California at the Esalen Institute in Big Sur. And again, that will be something that will go where these discussions don't normally go. I mean, it'll be with uh, a remarkably open-minded bishop, but a bishop all the same, um, in California. It's on his patch. Um, and again, uh, what we're going to be doing is looking at morphic resonance, holistic thinking in relation to spiritual practices, not spiritual dogmas, but spiritual practices, the things people actually do, like pilgrimages and prayers and mantras and chanting and ceremonies and rituals. Um, so those are some of the things coming up ahead. And meanwhile, my main activity, as always, is research. And um, I've got various research projects afoot at the moment, uh, and particularly ones on morphic resonance, which um, I'm planning in several laboratories in different parts of the world and engaged in discussing them with the scientists I'll be collaborating with. So more on that later. I don't want to talk too much about those now because they're in the planning stage still and um, we hope to get them started within a matter of a few months or even weeks. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we'll certainly look forward to hearing more about that as it unfolds. And it sounds like you have some great forums in which people can can meet you and, and see these ideas kind of take life. So uh, anyone interested, I'm sure they'll check out your website and find you there. Well, Dr. Sheldrick, thanks for coming on and talking about this interesting little controversy that has brewed. And uh, thanks again for joining me. Always a pleasure, Alex. Thanks again to Dr. Sheldrick for joining me today on Skeptico. A couple of questions to tee up for you. The first is, have the folks at TED, in particular Chris Anderson, done Rupert Sheldrick a favor by highlighting the dogmatism that is in materialistic science, or have they merely stepped in and provided the appropriate controls that science needs to keep weird ideas from spreading around? And the second question I'm going to make not such a lob softball question, and that's how do well-meaning science, technology, edgy, whatever you want to call it, news sites properly filter information so that on one hand we don't have to wade through a lot of nonsense, but on the other hand we don't get a homogenized message, or worse yet, a message that has been intentionally shaped for a particular purpose. So those are a couple of questions I'd throw out there. The place to respond, of course, is through the Skeptico website at S-K-E-P-T-I-K-O dot com. You can leave a message in the comment section or click on over to the forum and join us for a discussion there. As I mentioned at the beginning, I have a number of shows stacked up in the hopper ready to get out. So I'm going to try and get them out once a week here for a while until I get caught up. I hope you'll stay with me for all of that. I hope you'll, as usual, tell your friends about Skeptico, blog about Skeptico, get as many folks as you feel you'd like to involved in this community of a little bit closer to truth seekers, I guess you could say. But until then, 
Take care and bye for now.